Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Highland Park Public Library, we'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We are pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini series about books, culture, and what to read next. I'm Sarah Marie, and this is your Information Reader Services Department. In this episode, we are excited to share with you what we have been reading, watching, and or listening to during Shelf Isolation. To begin our mini series, I'm going to turn things over to Reader's Roundtable expert and moderator, Michelle. Thanks, Sam Marie. I just wanted to start with a book that I picked up this week. It is called How Much of These Hills is Gold? It's by C. Pam Zhang. I was actually super excited to read this. It's gotten a lot of really great reviews, and I actually did get through about 50 minutes of the audiobook, and then I kind of decided that maybe it wasn't something that I really wanted to read right now. So I've decided that for now I'm going to put it down. So hopefully soon I'll be able to pick it back up and I'll be able to tell you all, all about it. In the meantime, I'm going to pick up an old favorite. It's Let's Pretend This Never Happened. It's by Jenny Lawson. It's a really, really funny memoir about her eclectic life. So next week, I'll be able to tell you all about it. I've also decided to pick up another old favorite. This is Step Aside Pops. It's the second book by Kay Beaton. If you remember, they're just really funny, silly story, little comics about history and literature. They're just a lot of fun for you to kind of thumb through and have some laughs. And last but not least, I dusted off my old PlayStation 2 to pick up one of my favorite games, Kingdom Hearts 2. It's still wonderful. It's the second in the Kingdom Hearts series. It's Sora and Donald and Goofy who fight against the nobodies and the mysterious organization 13. And to do that, they travel through different worlds. So far, I have fought with Mulan and also the Beast. So I'm looking forward to playing more. As you can see, it's in PlayStation 2, but it's on many other PlayStations. So hopefully you'll pick it up because it's one of my favorites. And that's all for me. So I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie. Thank you, Michelle. This week, I returned to Karen Oden, and I listened to her first book, and it's called A Lady in Smoke. It was a really good Victorian mystery, and what happens is Lady Elizabeth Frazier is returning from her fourth season in London, which didn't go so well, and her mother is not the nicest person, and they get on the train, and they're going, and the next thing she knows, she wakes up, and the train has gone off the tracks, and it's on fire, so she's able, with the help of another person, to get her mother and herself out, and they're sitting and waiting, basically, on a ridge, and there's a lot of other people and she's watching this horrific fire and people are scrambling trying to get out and things. Eventually this doctor comes up to help her and her mother and her mother's pretty badly injured. She has a broken leg and plus it doesn't help that she's had quite a bit of laudum. He ends up carrying her mother to this wagon that gets them to the closest town. So then her mother's comfortable, she's comfortable. He's stitched up her head and everything and then she wakes up in the hotel that they're staying in and there's not much she can do and so she offers his assistance to this railway doctor and so she's helping Dr. Frazier treating patients and things and so anyway the story goes on she helps him and then of course that's kind of scandalous because and she introduces herself as Elizabeth Frazier not Lady Elizabeth well she doesn't want him to know that she is in a different class than he is so she goes back to her home he comes and he checks on her mother and things and in the meantime she finds out that that a lot of her dowry is tied up in railroad stock. And so the railroad's tanking right now. They've had this accident that now has turned out to be sabotage. And so Doctor and her, they're kind of piecing things together. And then surprisingly, he gets arrested. So the story goes on. It, it, it has the newspaper coming in, which of course they were viewed as very, basically everyone hated them. So people did not want to listen to or read about or tell them anything. But there's this friend of Dr. Wilcox, who helps Elizabeth, and they kind of like piece together things. Anyway, it's a very, very good story, very good twists and turns, and it was very enjoyable. The second book I read was The Furnace Girl, and this is based on a true story, but of course this is the fictionalized version of it. 
And it's about this lady that was found in Lake Bluff in the city hall in 1928, badly burned in the basement. And this is a true story that this did happen with this person. The author, Craig Moreland and Toby Jones, they fictionalized it. And it's really interesting because I thought it would be just about, you know, what happened to this lady because there was a lot of questions. She survived for a couple days and then, of course, she couldn't give them any information how she ended up in the basement and all this stuff. So the book ties in the Lake Bluff Orphanage, which I didn't realize that there was an orphanage in Lake Bluff, but it was there from 1894 to 1969. And it's really neat. The story starts out 10 years later, and this young man goes to interview the detective who had worked on the case. As the story goes along, you find out that the person who's the reporter grew up for a few years in this orphanage and he happened to have met Miss Nat. So it ties in like there's this former silent movie star that lives in Lake Bluff who's a part-time deputy. There's also you've got bootlegging going on because it's during prohibition and stuff. And so anyway, it was very, very fascinating. I learned a lot. They had a lot of really neat pictures from the actual Lake Bluff Historical Society showing the orphanage and different events that they were at. So a anyway, very enjoyable book. I highly recommend it. And last but not least, in last month's Real Simple, there's actually a really good article about libraries and 15 efforts that most libraries make and that they're even cooler than you think. And it talks about like they do story time, you can learn a language, you genealogy, all types of things. But anyway, it's a really good article and I highly recommend it. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Hey, thanks, Stephanie. My big news this week is that I finally finished A Climate of Fear, which I've mentioned probably twice before. It's a very longish, complex mystery by Fred Vargas, which is the pseudonym for a female French author who is actually, in her day job, a historian and archaeologist. I used a combination of listening and reading since the book is still here, since I can't return it, but I liked both ways of doing it. It was handy to have the choice to go back to the book when I needed to. Meanwhile, my holds on Libby were being fulfilled one after the other, and I thought, I'm under the gun now, what am I going to do? But there is a new feature, I think it was introduced in March, that lets you, you know, when you're notified that something is ready, let's say an ebook has come in for you, it says, the wait is over, ready to borrow, it gives you the title, and then there's a new choice called Deliver Later. You can hit that Deliver Later, and you will be given a sort of a sliding graphic that lets you choose, I think, from one to 21 days. You can postpone the arrival of this hold without leaving leaving your place in line. So I've been doing that over and over. So I'll soon find out if there's a limit to how many times you can do it. But the book I chose to actually get was Restoration by Olaf Olafsson, who, interestingly enough, speaking of the PlayStation, I didn't know this, but he is an Icelandic author who was instrumental in developing the PlayStation when he worked at Sony as an executive. He went from there to Time Warner. And as far as I know, he has left Time Warner. And I hope he's writing full time because this was really, I thought this was a really good book about, you know, 1944 in Italy. And there's an art restoration that's hidden and there's a lot of intrigue in other ways, you know, affairs and people's secrets. Olison was very economical with his use of language, didn't put in a lot of description, no real meandering plot, just very straightforward, but you could almost see it happening. I, I was picking out who I'd want to play in the movie as I read it, because I thought even with so few words, he really set the scene well. So as I said, I hope he's writing full time. He's written maybe four books by this time. And I've read two so far. What they have in common is that they both, you know, have had an Icelandic character or some combination with Iceland, even though the story is not set there. Okay, that's all for this week. I'm not sure what I'm going to read next. I'll look at my Libby Holds and see what looks good. So on to Nancy. Thank you, Karen. So I did finish up a mini series on Hoopla. The Scent of Rain on the Balkans, it's 14 episodes, so we use up all your Hoopla for two months. And it's the story of a Jewish Sephardic family in the Ottoman Empire going in through World War I and the new Yugoslavia and on through World War II. And there's four daughters, they have very interesting lives. It's well done. Some things kind of catch you because this is a real family written by one of the grandchildren. and one of the characters is a very well-known woman. If you are familiar with Ladino culture or Sephardic Jewish history, you might know the name of Laura Popo. And Laura, between the wars in young Yugoslavia, 
took it upon herself to try and preserve Ladino culture and Sephardic culture in Yugoslavia. And she also wrote herself. So she was very much a citizen archivist who preserved that unique Sephardic Jewish culture. Unfortunately, both Laura and her sons did not survive World War II after the Croatians joined the Nazis, but she left behind an incredible body of work. And so to have this, that uh, her niece wrote a book that's been nominated to miniseries that depicts the family and a very interesting depiction of the fall of the Ottoman Empire and a new country, Yugoslavia, and then World War II. Of course, and none of these institutions, these countries exist anymore. So it's very enjoyable. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky because we know about the family because of Laura and other sources, and they were very poor. They moved a little bit around the Ottoman Empire. This takes place in Sarajevo. And it depicts a family living in this big villa with a large lawn and a well. And we know this poor family. He was a shoemaker with eight kids living in a tiny little apartment. But what is true and what's great is how the daughters went out and made various livings and contributed to culture and society. The sons were, of course, drafted, and that's not a you know, that's not a good story. They spent very little time on that, but it's a, a good miniseries. It's well done. It's in Serbo-Croatian. It's translated, but well worth the time. Very enjoyable. And if you're interested in Sephardic Ladino culture, and I don't read Ladino, and very little of her work has been translated, much of Laura Popo's work, her birth name is Levi, is online on Google Books and Happy and the Jewish Woman's Archives. I also discovered some new opera pieces that were played at Rabinia that are no longer played anymore. For example, Michael Bergson's story of Luisa and discovered some fun music. And it's now a much sought after I found. There's a clarinet piece that was really popular and it is on Alexander Music. And it's also the sheet music. If clarinet is interested, it's on Library of Congress, the sheet music for Bergson's air from the Luisa opera. So it's always fun to encounter these new musics that's not played anymore. And I also discovered a great online resource that tells you how often operas are played. So because I'm not a musician or a musicologist, so I can go and look and say, okay, is this still played anymore or not? So you can see how the operas that have survived and the ones that are very popular in Ravinia that are no longer played a lot by operas, but we're going to make these programs available on the Illinois Digital Archive and Digital Library of America. And so kind of fun always going through these operas programs from Ravinia. Online are the ads. Juxtapose, you have the top, you can add for toothbrushes, and the bottom, of course, an ad for Green River Soda. Now, what I didn't know was Green River Soda is supposed to be lime flavored. I had no idea. And remember, this is prohibition because there's lots of soda ads in here. But additionally, Dr. West, when I was, I happened to look it up and read about it, was interesting. He was the first purveyor, he's a dentist in Kansas, to sell toothbrushes with the tips wrapped so they were sanitary. Because before that, you just stick and take it out of the bowl not very sanitary. And also later, this is from 1920 something, 24, later when nylon came out, he was the first to add nylon toothbrushes. So Dr. West is, you know, go, if you dig a little deeper, there's a little bit of history here, both of the soda and the toothbrush. And I'll hand this off to Lisa. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. So I am also going to plug something for a second time this week. I'm recommending again, Carry On by Rainbow Rowell. Having read it, I really, really enjoyed it. I haven't had a book make me actually laugh in a really long time, and we all kind of need that right now. So I really liked the voice. I loved having self-aware fantasy characters in a story. That's one of my favorite things in fantasy writing, especially if it's going to be YA. And I really, really like it when fantasy tropes are played like straight to the point where it's just ridiculous. It almost feels more realistic <laughs> when they do that, which is fun. The, the one thing is the set in England bits are a little over the top, but because it's kind of a parody-ish, that actually works really well. So I'm going to recommend Carry On by Rainbow Rowell. Again, it's on Libby. Definitely look into placing a hold if fantasy and comedy are your things. There's a sequel that is also out, and I don't know what the title is, but I'm going to find out and probably talk about it next week. And then the other thing that I've been really enjoying are the bonus borrow comics on Hoopla because there are a lot of them and they do not count towards your uh, monthly limit on borrows. So that is really fun. And they have like everything my friends have been pestering me to read for the last like two years. So there's Saga, The Wicked and the Divine, Lumberjanes, I think Alison Bechtel's Fun Home is there too. And if you want something a little less serious, they also have Archie Marries, where he marries Betty and Veronica, if that's more your thing. So, and they, they play out 
how that would work in two separate timelines. So Hoopla bonus borrows are really great. And then the thing that I'll be reading in the future is Fledgling by Octavia Butler. This is supposed to be really good. And Octavia Butler is a classic fantasy sci-fi author. She's won all kinds of awards. And somebody told me to read that if I wanted a book that was really good with internal character development stuff. So that's what I'm going to be checking out next. And with that, I'll pass this on to Sarah. Thanks, Lisa. So I'll start with my first recommendation from my 18-month-old. This is Pip and Posey, the super scooter. He just got a scooter, so we've been reading this a lot. I'm loving this series for him. They're written and illustrated by Axel Scheffler, who is the illustrator of all of Julia Donaldson's books, like The Gruffalo, Stickman, she has a whole bunch. But 18 months is still a little early to, like, listen to The Gruffalo. It's kind of a long book. So these are super short and simple, only a few words per page. Very cute illustrations, simple problem that gets resolved very quickly. Posey falls off her scooter. So very cute. And one day this week, we had read this five times before 9 a.m. So these are definitely a hit in my house. My recommendations. First book I read this week was The Cafe by the Sea by Jenny Colgan about a paralegal who goes to Scotland to try to work on a legal case, ends up opening a cafe. There's a lot of baking and romance, and they're really cute. If you're looking for a cozy romance set in Scotland, they're great. But my real recommendation is try a new author, and if you like them, then you have their entire backlist. I read my first Jenny Colgan book like two weeks ago, and this is the third one I've read. My next recommendation, I mentioned before we've been listening to audiobooks as a family and taking our Bluetooth speaker on walks. So the book we just started, which I've actually read before, is As You Wish by Carrie Elwes. For those who don't know, he played Wesley in The Princess Bride. This is probably my favorite audiobook ever. So he tells the story of making the movie The Princess Bride. He reads his own audiobook, and there are sections written by other actors, the director, Rob Reiner, and they all read their own sections of the book. So full cast, one of my favorite audiobooks, and I'm having a lot of fun sharing it with my husband. And finally, my last recommendation of the week, cookbook, The Defined Dish. I have a tendency to check cookbooks out from the library and then not have time to make anything from them before I have to return them. So it's been really nice to have them checked out for this long period of time and have time to actually make things. So this week we made the one pot chicken pot pie pasta. Delicious. I highly recommend. One of the nice things about this cookbook, there's a little box on each recipe that says if it's gluten-free, dairy-free, she also does Whole30, paleo, keto, all the different diets. And some of them, like this one, is dairy-free if modified. And then there's a little box at the bottom that explains the modification. But this recipe was delicious and toddler approved. Toddler ate two helpings. I've also previously made her one-pot hamburger helper, basically like hamburger helper, but from scratch. Very good. This recipe is also on her blog, so we can include a link in the show notes. Those are my recommendations, and I'll pass it on to Sarah Marie. Thanks, Sarah. As for what I'm reading, as I mentioned last week, I was kind of leaning into the pandemic. I am already a pretty big fan of post-apocalyptic and survivalist literature, but reading these genres during the current atmosphere was really something interesting. The first title that I read this week was Paul Tremblay's Survivor Song. It's not out yet. I believe it's going to be published in June or July. But in this novel, there is a rabies-like virus that spreads through society. And then in the middle of this, our protagonist, who is a pediatrician, she gets a call from her eight-month pregnant friend, Natalie, who then tells her that her husband just succumbed to the bite and that Natalie herself has also been bitten. And so the main plot through line is how to protect this unborn child. So in the book, the virus, the infection takes about an hour or less for people to become zombie-like and just like really aggressive. So with the baby to save and the book is only 330 pages, again, it only takes like an hour or so to be infected fully. So when I tell you this book moves fast, Like, it moves very fast. It is so atmospheric and scary that I almost shoved my Kindle into the freezer a few times to get away from it. Like, it is great. It is a very, very 
creepy. The second book that I read was Josh Mallerman's Mallory, which is a sequel to Bird Box. I got about three chapters into the book before I decided to reread Bird Box, and then I discovered I must have just watched the Netflix movie because I had no memory of the actual book. So in Bird Box, a mysterious something kind of arrives one day, nobody knows what it is or where it came from, and no one alive knows what it looks like, because once you see it, you are essentially injected with rage and immediately driven to action of violence. So our lead character in Bird Box is Mallory, hence the title of the sequel, and she essentially has to make her way to safety blindfolded because again she can't look at whatever is has arrived. So safety happens to be 20 miles down river, and again she has to travel blindfolded, and she also has two four-year-olds with her. So that is the concept of the book. It's great. Mallerman is adept at creating a sense of unnerving suspense. I cannot tell you how many times I got spooked and had to look behind me to make sure nothing was there while I was reading. And I also almost kicked one of the cats off the bed when they jumped up at a really inopportune moment during the book. If you don't like reading your horror or suspense genre, the Netflix adaptation of Bird Box stars Sandra Bullock and both she and the young girl in the film do just tremendous jobs acting out these characters. It's a really well done movie. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Jackie. Thank you, Sarah Marie. So a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned I was doing a reading challenge again this year called the Read Harder Challenge, which is put together by Book Riot. And one of the challenges is to read a memoir by someone from a religious tradition different from yours. So I happen to have the advanced reading copy of Unfollow by Megan Phelps. Roper. The subtitle of the book is called A Memoir of the Loving and Leaving the Westboro Baptist Church. And I will say I have a very negative impression of the Westboro Baptist Church, but I ran into reading this book trying to understand what the church's position was and why they decided to protest everything and anything. It starts the book talking about how when she was five years old, they started protesting at Gates Park in Topeka, Kansas. And she's holding a sign that she can't read. She didn't understand what it is, but she was so proud to be with the church. 80% of the church is her family, her aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers and sisters. So she was quite a believer in this church. And I have, like I said, a very negative impression of the church. And I kind of thought of them as uneducated rednecks. So when uh, Megan was talking about her father, she actually said, most people think of us as uneducated rednecks. So I thought it was kind of interesting how that was my impression. But they're actually a very highly educated family. Fred was born in Mississippi and raised there. Plan for him was to be in the military. He got into West Point, but he graduated at 16 and had to be at least 17 in order to have to go to West Point. So he took a year off, which actually changed his life because he went to a revival meeting and actually said, this is what I want to do with his life. So he became a minister. He and his wife and young child happened to arrive in Topeka, Kansas on the day the Brown versus the Board of Education Supreme Court decision was released. And he decided this is where he wanted to be to fight for civil rights, to fight for segregation. So he actually became a lawyer, started a law firm whose focus was on discrimination. And he actually received awards from the NAACP. And he was a big force in the Topeka area for this. But he also became a minister at the West World Baptist Church. And the church is very rigid in their beliefs. It basically, you believe what they said and you just follow along with it. So Megan grew up in this environment. Basically, everything in their life was filtered through the church's teaching. So when Megan was around 20, they started protesting at soldiers who were killed in Afghanistan's funerals. And this was kind of the first inkling that Megan had that maybe the church wasn't quite right. So the book Unfollow actually follows her beliefs in the church and her family, and then how she decided that this wasn't for her. And it's very interesting. My impression of Westboro Baptist Church is still not good, but at least I understand some of the churches and their positions. The second book I read, I read on Libby, and it's a book that I've had on my to be read list for a while. And I actually happened to see this in a column that DW File wrote in the Chicago Tribune a couple of weeks ago of pandemic books that you may want to read during the pandemic. And the book is Station 11 by Emily St. John Mandel. And it's a very interesting book. Uh, it's about a pandemic that 99.9% .9 of the population is 
blonde. The office created a story that I think is very interesting. She has Arthur Linder, who is an actor. And Arthur, actually, at the beginning of the book, is doing King Lear in Toronto. And he actually has a heart attack and dies on stage. But the people around Arthur, with the book kind of focuses on, the office goes back and forth between time. So you have the current time when the pandemic starts. Then you have, in the past, Arthur's life, and then the life of some of the people who tapped. Jeevan, who was a paramedic in training, who actually rushed onto the stage to help Arthur. You had Miranda, his first wife. Miranda was also an artist, and she created a series of graphic novels called Station Eleven. And these graphic novels actually played an important part in the book. Then you have Elizabeth, Arthur's second wife, who's the mother of his son, Tyler. You have Clark, Arthur's best friend. So you have their past and the future, because it goes in 20 years into the future. And it's a very interesting book. Kind of reading about a pandemic was probably kind of a weird at this point, but it really is a very good book. So the other thing, I've been trying to watch some comedies because it's kind of nice to have something fun. So I've actually started rewatching MASH, and I love MASH. I love MASH from the time it first started. It's such a very good show. But what I always find interesting about this show is they always had two main storylines, and I'll vividly remember one of the storylines and not remember the other storyline at all. And it's like very fun. That's what I've been doing this week. And I'm going to welcome William to the show and turn it over to him. Thank you very much for having me, Becky. And thank you for having me on here. The past couple of weeks for me have all been about Final Fantasy VII. And the reason for that is because of the release of Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is, as the title says, a remake of the 1997 PlayStation 1 game that was probably one of the most critically and commercially successful video game RPGs of all time. I think the thing that I find interesting about this game is that it, despite the title, is not a one-for-one remake of the game with just shinier visuals, even though it does look immensely better than the original game. But rather, the game leverages the fact that this is a series that happened before and that there have been three games in this series and a movie and there's just a lot of little easter eggs and twists they do to the story that make it just it's compelling enough that i'm going through it a second time right now now as part of immersing myself because i realized like it has been a long time since I last played these games. Matter of fact, I think I played it 23 years ago. I went and picked up a copy of this. This is 500 years later, an oral history of Final Fantasy VII by Matt Leone. I did the Kickstarter for this two or three years ago. And it's him talking to the various creative developers of the game and what they did. It was a big move for the company at the time because they were a primarily Nintendo company that switched publishers for the effort of making this game. One of my favorite stories to come out of it is they spent a lot of money on this game. It was one of the best looking games of its era. They spent upwards of $67 million. And I tell you that they went ahead and lost every original file for that game. They lost every single one years later. And the only reason they have them now is they did a port to the PC that the person who was head of the company that helped them with the port happened to have a master disc in a box that he took from the company that he left 10 years plus ago. So I found that immensely fascinating. There are a bunch of stories in there like that. The other thing I had to do, because again, it had been so long since I played this game, is I went ahead and found a good let's play of the game. That was by Good Friends Gaming. They did a plan to play through all of the Final Fantasy games. While they didn't succeed, because there are a lot of them, they did manage to play through all the Final Fantasy VII, and they do a good job of balancing just gameplay with meaningful commentary based on having played one through six up to that point. That is what I've spent my time doing, and I'm now going to pass it on to Catherine. Thanks, Will. So I'm going to start back in January when there was an episode of the New Yorker Fiction podcast that featured the story Barn Burning by Haruki Murakami. And the format of the New Yorker Fiction podcast is they will invite an author on the show who reads a different author's story. So in this case, Murakami's story Barn Burning was read by Andrea Lee, and I just really loved the way that she read it. And I had read the story, I think, once before. It was in Murakami's collection, The Elephant Vanishes, but this reading really stuck in my mind. And on the podcast, Andrea Lee and 
the host also talked about a Korean movie, Burning, which came out a couple of years ago, which had been based in part on this story. So this week I watched Burning. It's directed by Cheng Dong Lee, and it cues to the original story pretty closely in parts, and then it kind of goes on. So Murakami's original story is set in Japan, and it's about a married man who kind of has this affair with a young woman, not really serious, but she goes on a trip to Africa, and then she comes back with a boyfriend, basically, this guy that she's met there. And he is very rich, apparently, and very slick. And he drives this fancy silver sports car. And the sort of the three of them just sort of hang out together. And as the story goes on, it just becomes a little more sinister. You kind of wonder, what is this guy's deal? Then at one point, he reveals that he burns barns. And it sort of like goes on from there, but I don't want to like give away, you know, the whole ending. Uh, but he says, you know, this is just something that I do. I, you know, I scout a location and, you know, every couple of months I just burn down an unused barn. And that's about the right pace for me. So in the movie, it's translated to Korea. We sort of have a main character who's like not exactly the same young man. He's an unmarried man. He's an aspiring writer. He sort of lives on his father's property, but his father's in this legal trouble, which is sort of the subplot. And then it sort of follows the same general pace, but then where Murakami's story ended, the movie sort of goes on and it sort of resolves things in its own way. So I enjoyed that movie, but then I also went back because Murakami for his story, Barn Burning, took the title from a William Faulkner story, Barn Burning. So I went back and I read the Faulkner story, which I thought I had never read, but again, I realized, I think at some point, way in the past, I had actually read the story. It's a very different short story, but after having seen the movie Burning, I could see that it maybe at least thematically brought in a little bit of Faulkner's story. In Faulkner's story, it's about, again, a young man whose father is a sharecropper and his father is basically abusive and he kind of has this problem where he's sort of carrying out his private class war by burning down people's barns. And he sort of <laughs> has done this sort of serially. So he has this, this kind of you know, legal problem stemming from that. It was really interesting to see these three different takes on sort of the same theme. And then this morning, I went back and I listened to the New Yorker Fiction Podcast reading of Barn Burning again, which I again enjoyed. Now I think I'm done with it. So that took up most of the week, and I will now pass it on to Lori. Thanks, Catherine. This past week, I read a book called Forrest Gump, which came out before the movie by Winston Groom. You probably heard of the movie because Tom Hanks was in it, and it was a, a very good movie. The book, like I said, it came out before the movie. Forrest Gump is the same sort of character. It's told from his viewpoint. He is called all sorts of names, but then he, he gets really giant and then he gets recruited to play football at Alabama. And then the story kind of goes off in different ways. A lot of the characters are the same or have the same names, but they have different backstories or the characters evolve differently than they did in the movie. His mother in the book spends a lot of time wringing her hands and crying and isn't quite like the wise Sally Field character that she was in the movie. But it was it was good, It was I enjoyed it. It was a, a fun book. It's written in vernacular, which didn't bother me as much as sometimes it does. I would recommend that if you can find it hanging around your house, which is, how I found mine, and you just want to read. It did not take me long to read. It's not very long. And then you can go watch the movie again, too. Another thing I read this week was an article from the New Yorker, which uh, the library has available through RB Digital. RB Digital is a collection of 76 magazines that you can access with your library card. You can read them on any number of devices. So definitely look through them because all sorts of magazines. Um, it's a great resource. In the April 20th New Yorker, there was a profile of Dr. Anthony Fauci, who you have heard of. He's been around for a very long time. He actually was quite a controversial figure uh, during the AIDS crisis because a lot of people with AIDS at that time felt that he was standing between them getting treatments that at the time were still very experimental. And then he got to know these people and worked with them to change a lot of the rules for testing because 
with AIDS at the time, it was really a matter of life and death. You know, if a drug was available, you really could not wait. So the author, Michael Spector, apparently has been writing about these issues since then. And he, you know, goes into the background. It's a really good article. And he talks about how Fauci got interested in research medicine as opposed to online medicine. And I enjoyed reading it. It really gave me a lot of background. And then things came up that I was like, well, yeah, I remember that back then, you know. So, and I have even more respect for the man than I did before I read the article. That is what I have been doing in the past week. And now I am going to pass it back to Sarah Marie. Well, okay. That is it for us today, folks. As always, please remember we are all here for you. We are available for any comments, questions, or concerns that you may have. And you can reach us online through Facebook at facebook.com slash hplibrary, through our Twitter, which is at hplibrary, or via email, which is H-P-P-L-A at hplibrary.org. As always, you can find this information online through our website, which is hplibrary.org. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod. You can find more information about this and the titles we mentioned in our show notes below. Okay, everybody, this is us signing off. Until we see you next, stay safe. Stay safe.